This episode contains strong language and also contains references to eating disorders. Please see the episode description for information about support services. All right, okay, should we just do this? Well, do you want to? Because I feel like in the last few weeks, your heart's not really been in it. No, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm here. Okay, I think we need to clear the air. Have you been hosting other podcasts? <sighs> Look, it was a few times, if that, and I was a guest, really. Right, because I don't find that that reassuring. Honestly, they don't mean anything to me. Alice, I need to know that it won't happen again. I can promise you it's unlikely. I just feel like recording this episode is a terrible idea. Yeah. Do it anyway? Yeah. 6th of September, 1997. St James's Palace, London. Prince Charles takes a deep breath, then begins walking behind the open gun carriage as it slowly moves towards Westminster Abbey. The coffin within is draped in the royal standard and covered in lilies and a wreath of pink and cream roses. Sitting upon it is a single handwritten card, the front of which reads simply, Mummy. A lump forms in Charles's throat as he glances at his two young sons who walk alongside him, heads bowed. He takes in the thousands of mourners lining the route, many of whom sob openly. It's been a week since a car crash in Paris killed Charles's ex-wife, Diana, at just 36 years old. In the days that followed, Every aspect of the royal family's behaviour, past and present, has been poured over by the press. At times, it has seemed like a full-blown constitutional crisis is on the cards. But today, to Charles's relief, there are only messages of love and support. As he listens to Elton John singing a specially written version of Candle in the Wind, Charles reflects on his marriage to this beautiful, complicated woman. They shared some wonderful moments. They produced two incredible boys. It wasn't all bad. If, like him, the British public can keep that in their hearts and minds, he's sure the monarchy will survive this. But those hopes evaporate when Diana's brother, Earl Spencer, begins his eulogy. Diana, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all that we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men, so that their souls are not simply immersed in duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. I remember this on telly. It was electric. He captures a moment, which was also in the public's mind, about how she'd been treated by the royals, and it felt like a mad act of rebellion. At first, Charles is confused by a low rumbling emanating from outside. Then he realises it's applause from the crowd. It travels through the great west door, down the nave. Now the guests in the abbey are clapping too. Everyone except him and the rest of the royals. Charles glances at his mother, the Queen. She stares ahead, bound, as always, by duty. Charles feels a rising sense of anger. How dare the Earl lecture him? How dare the public? They don't know how hard it's been for him to put the crown first. But then it dawns on him that maybe they're right. Duty and tradition led to this almighty mess in the first place. Duty is the reason why Camilla, the one person he wishes could comfort him right now, can't be here. In fact, if this last week is anything to go by, she will never be accepted by his side again. And Charles is certain that his reign, should it ever come, will be utterly hollow without her. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. The show where we bring you the murkier stories that ever happened on these odd little isles. British scandals come in many shapes and sizes. Some are about money, some are about sex. They're all about power. But when we look at scandals a little bit closer, they turn out to be stranger, wilder, just plain weirder than we remember. 
So we're journeying back to ask who's to blame for what happened. And when the dust settled, did anything really change? Matt, I think it's fair to say that we are not a nation that typically likes big gestures of love or kind of public shows of emotion. But we have had some great love stories. Chantel and Preston. (laughs) The first I would have also listed, yep. Katie Price and Peter Andre in the jungle. (laughs) Phil and Sharon and Grant and Sharon. (laughs) Anyone else and Sharon on EastEnders? All classics. All classics. I suppose I'm thinking of a union that was even more era-defining. Tony and Gordon. This couple that I'm thinking of are a poor second to them, of course, but lots of similar themes. Betrayal, different camps briefing against each other, just general simmering resentment. Yes, I hadn't actually realised how many parallels there are. This story also has unique issues of its own. Gender politics, the trope of the scorned woman, societal status and breeding is very important. And of course, duty over desire. When Prince Charles married Diana Spencer in 1981, the world celebrated what looked like a fairy tale union. But Charles was hiding a dark secret, a relationship that almost brought down the British monarchy. You may think you know this story, but there's so much more than meets the eye. This is episode one. Fred and Gladys. From Wondery and Campside Media comes season three of the hit podcast Suspect. This is a story of two victims, one murdered in cold blood, one in prison for a crime he did not commit. Listen to Suspect, Five Shots in the Dark, wherever you get your podcasts, or binge all eight episodes ad-free on Wondery+. April 1972. Smith's Lawn, Windsor Great Park. Prince Charles jumps off his horse, proudly strokes her mane. The 23-year-old's white jersey is soaked through with a mixture of water and sweat. His tan breeches flecked with mud. Sexy. (laughs) Is that doing it for you? It's making me want to buy Ralph Lauren products. (laughs) The polo field is his happy place, the perfect break from his naval duties. (laughs) He hears laughter behind him. Charles turns to see the smiling face of Lucia, a friend from his days at Cambridge. But it's the woman next to her who speaks first. Her low, husky voice sends a shiver down Charles's spine. That's a fine animal, sir. Charles has been tutored in small talk since he was a child. But taking in this girl, he's speechless. She wears green Wellington boots, brown corduroy trousers and a dark green barber jacket. Her light brown, chin-length hair flicks up at the ends. Her blue eyes light up as she smiles. Lucia breaks the silence. This is Camilla Shand. Camilla, may I introduce Prince Charles? Your Royal Highness, I'm so pleased to meet you. It's as if an electric current pulses through Charles as he takes her hand. He's never felt such instant attraction to anyone. He looks to Lucia for help. She grins. You must be careful around this one, Charles. Her great-grandmother was the mistress of your great-grandfather, you know. So there's two things there. One, this previous, but also two, they might be related. Bit weird, but also royals. If that's going to bother you, you're not going to like this story. (laughs) That's actually probably the most diverse that gene pool has been. (laughs) Charles's heart thuds. Although he's had a couple of short-lived romances, he's always lacked confidence with the opposite sex. He feels so self-conscious, and he hates his appearance, especially the way his ears stick out. But something makes him step up now. Perhaps you'd like to join me for a drink in the clubhouse? Camilla nods and they move inside. Desperate to impress, Charles orders a bottle of the most expensive champagne they have. When the waiter brings it over... Charles dismisses him, keen to pour Camilla's glass himself. But he's so nervous, he knocks the bottle, spilling it over the table. Camilla jumps back in shock. Charles grabs a cloth, starts trying to mop her down. Camilla laughs. Oh, it's fine. Don't you know the real way to win girls over is with two ounces of jelly babies? Charles stops mopping and looks at her, stunned. Can she really be making a reference to his favourite radio show? You like the goons? 
Camilla nods. She takes out a packet of cigarettes, offers Charles one. Have a gorilla. Charles beams. It's a running gag from the show. No thanks, I've just put one out. The pair roar with laughter. Soon they're chatting like old friends. He learns Camilla is a year older than him, a former debutante from a distinguished family. I've heard about debutantes before, but what does it exactly mean? I mean, there is no equivalent in our world, but I think it's a sort of presentation of a selection of eligible young women who are being sort of showcased to prospective husbands. It just feels weird. This is like launching the new iPad, but with your <laughs> daughter. It feels very strange. And did you have a debutante ball? No, I don't think that there is a comprehensive school version of that. Wait, did you? Oh, God, no. I'm, I'm still being withheld from society. What's the one where you're just kept in a bell tower? Rapunzel. <laughs> no, the other one. Oh. <laughs> Quasimodo. Quasimodo. He also discovers the great-grandmother Lucia mentioned was Alice Keppel, who did indeed have a long-running affair with King Edward VII. Charles would usually feel embarrassed talking of such things, but somehow with Camilla, it's not mortifying. It's thrilling. He doesn't even mind her chain-smoking, a habit he usually abhors. There's something else, too. Charles is used to having girls fawn over him. But Camilla seems coolly detached. He's certain that if he's going to see her again, he will have to do the chasing. He's not used to putting his heart on the line, risking rejection. But before he can stop himself... Uh, I've decided that it's my uh, royal duty to find out more about this grandmother of yours. We must make sure that as a blood relative of such a floozy, you can pose absolutely no threat to the future of the monarchy. So, um, uh, would you care to join me for supper sometime? Camilla hesitates for a moment, then flashes a smile. Why not? Charles struggles to contain his glee. He's got a great feeling about this girl. October 1972, Broadlands Estate, Hampshire. Lord Dickie Mountbatten looks out of the drawing room window to the immaculately mowed lawn of the gardens. He watches Charles feed Camilla a strawberry. The pair gaze into each other's eyes as if they're the only two people in the world. Feeding another person in that way, unless they're a baby, it, <laughs> it's like you're feeding an animal. It doesn't really feel like it's a sensual thing. Have you ever done the rolling the Malteser down the measuring tape? No, well, <laughs> how does that work? Measuring tape? OK, we've got quite an afternoon ahead of us. Dicky sighs, deeply troubled. He may be Charles's great uncle, but he's always seen himself as more of a surrogate father to the boy. He knows that's how Charles regards him too. And over the years, he's taken it upon himself to act as a guide and confidant. He encouraged Charles to bring Camilla here so that he can get to know the ways of women away from the prying eyes of the palace. But now he fears that was a misstep. Joining the pair in the garden, Dickie waits for Camilla to go and change for dinner. Then he takes Charles for a stroll through the estate's vast grounds. I see you and Camilla have become very close these last few months. Charles beams with pride. We have. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like she sees the real me. Dickie looks at Charles. He decides it's best to be blunt. Charles, Camilla is a lovely girl, but she has no title. This tryst has no future. Camilla is fine for sowing your wild oats, and sow them you must at your age. But for a wife, you must choose a member of the aristocracy. And that is the ways of women. Lesson one. Done. Charles looks furious. I hardly think that matters. I love Camilla, and I believe she loves me too. Dickie hesitates, but decides Charles needs to hear this. It's not just that she's a commoner. She also has a... How can I put this delicately? A history. She's sullied, dear boy. And the Prince of Wales cannot marry someone of... Impure virtue. The hypocrisy is obviously something we've covered on British Scandal. On the one hand, he's saying, go out and sow your wild oats. And then on the other hand, he's saying, oh, but keep away from her because she's been with other people before. Yeah, absolutely. And it also 
highlights an obsession with virginity, which becomes central and important when he's looking for somebody different, perhaps, to fill that wife role. To Dickie's despair, Charles shakes his head. This is the 20th century, for goodness sake. Camilla makes me happier than I've ever been. I refuse to throw her away for some ancient rule that takes no account for the heart. It's clear Charles is too far gone to listen to reason. Dickie realises he'll have to find another way to put an end to this. I'm sorry, Charles. Let's not fall out. I couldn't bear it. Charles immediately softens. That's the last thing I want, Grandpapa. You know how important you are to me. Dicky retreats to his study, where he calls an old friend, a naval commander. I need your help with something. Prince Charles is rather tired of life on HMS Norfolk. Would it be possible to post him somewhere more exotic? The last thing Dicky wants is to see Charles heartbroken. But he tells himself this is for his own good. The monarchy will never accept Camilla as his choice of wife. This way, Charles won't even have to fight that battle. Camilla will tire of waiting for him. Look elsewhere. Then Charles can fulfil his destiny with a more suitable bride. Six years later, 14th of November 1978, South West London. While his dresser finishes brushing down his dinner jacket... Charles's eyes rest on the newspapers on the desk nearby. Every single one mentions the fact he's turned 30 today. But do they talk about his successful stint in the armed forces or his new charity initiative for young people, the Prince's Trust? No. All they seem concerned with is that he's still unmarried. He's even acquired a nickname, the Playboy Prince. Charles determines to forget all about that tonight at the party that the Queen is throwing for him. But walking down the magnificent staircase of the palace's 40-metre-long ballroom, he spots every single titled girl he's dated over the past few years. This is like a cheese dream. This is fatter at midnight, isn't it? To his left, Lady Leonora and Lady Jane Grosvenor, the daughters of the 5th Duke of Westminster, sip champagne. To his right, Lady Henrietta Fitzroy laughs uproariously with her father, the 11th Duke of Grafton. Royal socialite Kanga Tyron is in hushed conversation with keen fox hunter Davina Sheffield. Charles wonders if they're comparing notes. It's like you've used a random posh name generator. <laughs> now Charles spots his father in the crowd, turning to look for him. He knows what's coming his way. Another rant about failing once again to find a wife. Charles swerves the other way, grabs a glass of fizz from a nearby waiter and anxiously takes a sip. Scanning the other side of the room, Charles is thrown by the sight of another ex, Camilla. His heart quickens. He wasn't expecting her to be here. Spotting him, she smiles. Charles thinks about going over, but then Camilla turns away and starts chatting to her husband of five years, Andrew Parker Bowles. She's moved on, my boy. Hard as it is, you must too. Charles turns to find Dickie beside him. At least his grandpapa understands what he's been through. He was a great support when Charles returned from his overseas naval posting to find Camilla had married Andrew. He once again encouraged Charles to sow those wild oats, which he's been doing in an effort to forget. But tonight, even Dickie seems to have had enough. There are some lovely ladies here. No harm looking for the one, eh? Charles allows Dickie to steer his attention away from Camilla and introduce him to the few suitable girls in the room he hasn't already been fixed up with. It will keep his father off his back, if nothing else. But as the party winds down, he doesn't ask any of them back to his apartment in the palace for a nightcap. Instead, he drives to a friend's flat in nearby Kensington, where Camilla is waiting. Charles rushes into her arms, kisses her passionately. Hello, Gladys. Hello, Fred. I'm guessing they take these nicknames from their favourite radio comedy. Yep, nicknames from The Goon Show because they have only one in joke. <laughs> Whenever Charles hears Camilla call him Fred, his heart melts. It makes him feel normal, regular, not Sir or Your Majesty, just the version of himself he can be with her. He and Camilla rekindled their romance in secret a couple of years ago, when a heartbroken Camilla 
turned to Charles for comfort in the wake of her husband's infidelity. Holding her in his arms, Charles feels a calmness wash over him. Camilla breaks the spell. We can't keep doing this, you know. Charles knows she's right. Royal mistresses may have been accepted in the past, but these days the public expects a future monarch to be faithful. Once Charles marries, this will be over. That's why he's been stalling on finding a wife. Of course we can. I shall just have to keep playing the playboy prince. As far as Charles is concerned, the press and the royal family can apply all the pressure they want. If he can't have Camilla in public, marriage is off the agenda. Nine months later, 27th of August, 1979, Gloucestershire. Charles watches as Camilla thunders past a nearby group of hunters on her horse, keen to get to the front of the pack, as always. Charles laughs. God, he loves this woman. He specifically goes to this hunt near her home so he can see more of her. With Andrew working as an instructor at Sandhurst during the week, doing goodness knows what and with whom, their setup works for everyone. Hunt over, Charles is about to head off to the clubhouse when a page approaches. Your Royal Highness, there's an urgent phone call for you. Charles keeps his eyes on Camilla, who looks over her shoulder at him. Can it wait? They're about to serve lunch. It's Her Majesty. Charles wishes he could ignore it, but he can't ignore a call from his mother. He follows the page to a private room, picks up the receiver. Hello, Mummy. Charles. There's a pause. Charles waits. I don't quite know how to say this. It's sticky. He's been murdered. Charles grips the receiver so hard, his knuckles go white. He thinks his legs might buckle beneath him. Then his military training kicks in. He takes a deep breath. Listens as the Queen explains that the Mountbatten family fishing boat has been blown up by the IRA, a paramilitary group of Irish nationalists. Dickie and two others were killed instantly. I'll come to Balmoral immediately, Mama. Charles walks back to where his friends are gathered. He can't bring himself to share what's happened. They'll hear about it on the news soon enough. The only person he wants to confide in is Camilla. But as he starts to walk over to her, Andrew arrives with their children, who excitedly run to their mother. She pulls them in for a kiss, chats with Andrew... Charles's heart sinks. He slips away without saying goodbye. When Charles arrives at Balmoral, the rest of the family are already gathered. His sister, Anne, fights back tears as they hug. Charles kisses his mother on the cheek. His father pats him on the shoulder, stoic as ever. His younger brothers, Andrew and Edward, say all the right things. What a terrible loss. Such a wonderful man. It all feels hollow to Charles. No one understood him like Grandpapa did. They can't imagine his agony. As talk turns to formalities and protocol, Charles has never felt more isolated. All he wants to do is cry on the shoulder of someone who loves him. But he knows deep down what he needs to do. To honour Dickie, he has to give up the woman he loves and find his virgin bride. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in U.S. history, presidential lies, environmental disasters, and corporate fraud. Our newest series looks at the rise and fall of Spiro Agnew, the former vice president of the United States. Agnew was a firebrand who rose to power on a message of political populism, challenging the media and those he criticized as cultural elites. His message resonated with a broad array of voters, and in just over a decade, he rose from a position on a local zoning board in Baltimore County to become vice president under Richard Nixon. But at the same time Nixon's administration was collapsing under the weight of Watergate, Agnew was facing a brewing scandal himself. Federal prosecutors had begun a wide-reaching investigation into political corruption, and when Agnew became a target, the country faced the prospect of a constitutional crisis. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts, and you can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app.
July 1980, Cowdery Park, Sussex. Lady Diana Spencer steps out of her friend's mini filled with anticipation. The 19-year-old usually finds polo rather dull. But today, she races over to the field on a mission. Prince Charles's team are playing, and her flatmates have challenged her to get a date with society's most eligible bachelor. He's 31, almost 32 at this stage, and she's 19. Yes. I never really appreciated how big the age gap was. Diana has met Charles once or twice before at parties. Her older sister, Sarah, even dated him a couple of years back. He's been with everyone. Not a stone left unturned. Diana never considered him to be particularly attractive then. But watching him play now, she's struck by his confidence on horseback and his athletic physique. When the game is done and a barbecue starts up, she keeps her eyes on him. Charles is surrounded by several friends and countless beautiful women. But he looks sad. Diana wonders how many of these people actually know Charles and how many are simply hangers-on. She decides it's time to make her move, save him from this yawn-inducing mob. She runs her fingers through her short blonde hair, takes her sunglasses off to reveal her baby blue eyes. Then she heads over, stands in front of him and curtsies. Your Royal Highness, we've met before. I am Sarah Spencer's little sister. Charles studies her, as if trying to recall. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Diana, isn't it? Diana's touched he remembers her. But then he falls silent, seems to draw back into himself. Diana's not sure what to do. Is this the prince's way of dismissing her? One of the sophisticated women nearby eyes her disdainfully, whispers to her friend. Diana looks down at her floral dress with its Peter Pan collar, touches her fluffy pink cardigan. She suddenly feels every bit her youthful 19 years. She's about to scurry away when she remembers that Charles lost his great uncle last year. She feels she should at least offer her condolences. I was so sorry about Lord Mountbatten. Sarah told me you were very close to him. You must have felt terribly lonely when he died. Charles seems to wake up at the mention of the name. Diana wonders if she's overstepped, but then he smiles sadly. How lovely of you to say. Yes, I did. Still do. Diana doesn't see a prince anymore, just a man who's in pain. She decides to ignore all the eyes trained on her and instead say what's in her heart. You're in need of care, I think. I'm a nursery nurse, something of an expert. Diana flashes him a hopeful smile and Charles returns it with a chuckle. She finds herself giggling, something she always does when she's nervous. Charles soon becomes more friendly, asks her questions about herself. As they chat, Diana can't help but flirt. She lowers her eyes, looking up at him from under her long fringe. This isn't about a dare anymore. She genuinely likes Charles. I wonder, would I be able to see you again sometime? Diana beams and gives Charles a small nod. She feels like a giddy schoolgirl. The future King of England has just asked her out on a date. This is the stuff that fairy tales are made of. Seven months later, February 1981, Highgrove House, Gloucestershire. Charles digs into the earth pulls up another crop of weeds. Tossing them into the barrow behind him, he stands up straight and admires his work. He spent the whole weekend out here, and he's barely made a dent in the 347 acres of land that he's planning to transform. But to Charles, that doesn't matter. He'd be here more if he could, in nature, away from the pressures of duty in the prying press in London. That's not the only reason he bought this 18th century manor last year. It's just a few miles from Camilla's home, making it easier than ever to visit her when Andrew is away for work. Hearing a car pull up the driveway, he warms at the prospect of seeing her. Instead, his father comes into view. Charles smiles through gritted teeth. Papa, what a lovely surprise. Philip cuts to the chase. 
About Diana. Charles immediately tenses. He should have known what this visit was really about. For the past few months, he's been tentatively courting Diana. The press has picked up on dates that followed in London and gone into a frenzy. It's still early days. Poppycock, we both know she's ideal. And let's face it, you've barely any options left. It's true that many of his previous girlfriends have married, leaving a smaller pool of eligible girls. And yes, Diana is a 20-year-old virgin who's behaved impeccably and beguiled the British media. He's genuinely fond of her. But they've met less than a dozen times. It's all happening too fast. That clearly doesn't bother his father, though. Stop dithering, Charles. You must either propose to Diana or release her. They talk about prospective wives like football clubs talk about players. It's sort of like transfer deadline day, isn't it? Offer a new contract or let her go on a free. Charles eyeballs his father, disbelieving. But Philip shows no sign of softening. Desperate to get rid of him, Charles promises to make a decision by the end of the day. But before he can, he needs to talk to the person whose opinion matters most. Diana. Oh, Matty, Matty, Matty. How I wish you were right. An hour later, Charles is at Bolhide Manor, Camilla's 17th century home, pouring his heart out. I feel like I'm trapped in a bad dream. Everyone's decided she's the one except me. She's a lovely girl, but what do we really have in common? Her Sloan range of friends are like an alien breed, all pop music and parties in London. Camilla takes a long drag on her cigarette. As she exhales, she looks defeated. You must marry her, Charles. Charles stares at her, shocked. But Camilla simply sighs. You and I both know the pressure won't stop until you've given them all what they want. Diana's young. She's beautiful. She will produce an heir. You can come to love her. I'm sure. Camilla's eyes burn into his. Charles knows how hard this all must be for her. Maybe, but she isn't you. Camilla takes him into her arms. But of all our options, she's the best. I can focus on my marriage to Andrew, try harder to make it work. Perhaps this will be the push we need. This is terrible logic. Charles tries to envision himself standing at the altar with another woman, Diana. With Camilla's blessing, it doesn't seem so crazy. But we will stay friends, won't we? Of course, you'll always have me in your life, darling. Charles draws her close telling himself he can do this. If friends is what it takes to fulfil his destiny and keep Camilla in his life, then friends it is. March 1981, Claridge's Hotel, London. From her table in the centre of the restaurant, Camilla watches Diana approach. She keeps her head low, as if wanting to fade into the background. Yet excited murmurs sweep through the room. Every single diner seems to be mesmerised. Camilla has never courted attention, but she can't help feeling a stab of jealousy. With Charles away on a tour of Australia, she couldn't help but take the opportunity to invite Diana to lunch, check out the competition. That's weird. She couldn't help it? I would say you could do lots of other things. Power move. Now, as Diana sits down... Camilla's also overcome with the urge to mark her territory. She forces a rictus smile. Do let me see that gorgeous ring up close. Diana holds out her hand, giving Camilla a good look at the 12-carat oval sapphire set in white gold, surrounded by 14 solitaire diamonds. I chose the design myself. Thought as much. It's rather flash for Fred's tastes. Fred? Oh, gosh, sorry, force of habit. It's a silly nickname I gave Charles years ago. Do you know the goons? Diana shakes her head. She looks lost. Camilla can't help a wry smile. She goes on to say Charles told her all about the proposal, making it clear they're still close. By the time the waiter delivers the first course, Diana seems dejected. She pushes her smoked salmon around the plate unenthusiastically. 
Not on the wedding diet already, are you? I think I could shed a few pounds. Charles mentioned my puppy fat when I wore that black dress to our first public outing last week. That's just an appalling thing to say to her. Appalling and knowing what we know about her disordered eating, which is well discussed, it's just particularly cruel. Camilla is struck by how insecure Diana suddenly seems. When she goes on to talk about her daily life, it's clear she's been struggling. They moved me into Clarence's house to keep me safe from the press. But it feels a bit like prison. Feeling for Diana, Camilla throws her a bone. You should come hunting with my lot sometime. Oh, no thanks. I find all that rather distasteful. Camilla's concerned. Doesn't this girl like any of the same pursuits as Charles? Diana, I realise we don't know each other that well. But what you must realise about Charles is that he's happiest in the country, riding a horse. Embrace his passions, and you won't go far wrong. Secret to a happy marriage, blood sports. (laughs) Diana seems grateful for the advice. Camilla orders them some wine. She's determined that even if she can't have Charles... She'll ensure he's kept happy, even if that means giving Diana tips. It may hurt like hell, but this is for the man she loves. Twenty seventh of July, nineteen eighty one, St Paul's Cathedral, London. From the back of the famous building, Charles ignores the film crews setting up, the small group of royals, including the Queen and Prince Philip waiting patiently for his wedding rehearsal to begin. Instead, he takes in the elaborate stonework, the beautiful mosaics, the seemingly endless nave. Anything to distract him from the fact that the big day is only 48 hours away and he still doesn't feel ready. Getting married puts a lot of pressure on people anyway. People get nervous before the big day. But knowing that your wedding is going to be beamed around the world in a highly formal setting must make it more nerve-wracking. Yeah, and the fact that you don't want to marry the bride. That's the other element of it. Yeah, so, you know, bit of this, bit of that. When Diana arrives 20 minutes late, he's reminded why. It's not just that her expression is always so sullen these days and her mood's so up and down. She looks physically wrecked too. Her waist has all but disappeared. Her once rosy cheeks are pale. Determined to be supportive, he greets her with a smile. I thought you'd stood me up for a moment, shall we? Charles guides her to the altar, where the Archbishop of Canterbury is waiting to talk them through the blessings he'll be carrying out. Charles listens carefully, occasionally glancing sideways at Diana. She refuses to meet anyone's eye, wringing her hands silently. When the rehearsal is over, Charles follows Diana into a waiting car. As he twists to grab his seatbelt, he sighs, weary with the anticipation of the brewing storm. Honestly, what is the matter with you? But when he turns to look at Diana, he's alarmed to see she's sobbing. She takes something out of her jacket pocket, thrusts it into Charles's hands. This is... Charles looks at the small package she's holding, which is addressed to Camilla. His blood runs cold as he realises what's inside. Diana, listen... She forcefully shakes the contents into his hand. It's a gold bracelet, clearly expensive. But the real kicker is the small blue enamel disc hanging from it, engraved with the entwined initials F and G. I know F stands for Fred, but what's the G? Charles struggles to find the right words. He had gifted a number of these pieces to friends, but none with such a personal dedication. Diana must have gone through them before they were sent. I thought she was being kind, spending so much time with me. Now I see it for what it is. Charles's anxiety makes him falter as he struggles to explain. No, you must understand. Camilla has in the past been one of my most intimate friends. But that intimacy has now ended. This is simply a token of friendship. Is it, though? Because it feels like quite a romantic gift. It's jewellery, it's their initials from their pet names. The initials are entwined. This is an example of such self-denial, isn't it? The idea that this could ever have been 
a platonic relationship that allowed them to have successful marriages was really ridiculous. Diana shakes her head, her tears falling harder. Do you still love her? Charles is completely thrown by the question. He doesn't know how to respond. What? I, um, uh, sorry, I... Diana chokes out a laugh of disbelief before turning to face the window. Charles's heart roars in his ears as he tries to assess the damage. He has no idea what Diana is capable of in this state. She could tell the press about Camilla's gift. She could even go as far as calling off the wedding. And if she does, the consequences don't bear thinking about. It won't just be disastrous for Charles, but for the entire British monarchy. Twenty seventh of July, nineteen eighty one, Bowlhide Manor, Gloucestershire. At the kitchen table, Camilla drags on her cigarette. Diana's photo stares back at her from the Times commemorative wedding pullout. Camilla closes the page, tells herself there's no point dwelling. It's a done deal. She's jolted from her thoughts by the sight of Charles's car pulling into the driveway. They'd agreed not to meet following the engagement, but that doesn't stop her rushing to the door. I thought this wasn't allowed. I had to see you. Andrew's not here, is he? No, silly, he's in London, preparing for your big day. Charles nods, remembering. As a commanding officer of the Household Cavalry Mounted Regiment, Andrew must accompany the newlywed's carriage after the service. This is like an EastEnders Christmas special, but (laughs) posh. (laughs) Oh, God. Also given that, allegedly, he's embarking on an affair with Princess Anne around about this time. (laughs) As Camilla ushers Charles in, he explains that Diana had a meltdown after their rehearsal. He holds up a gold bracelet. She discovered this. I had it made as a gift for you. I thought I might as well deliver it in person. After all, the wedding's probably off now, anyway. Oh, Charles, it's beautiful. Camilla takes in the disc with the F and G as he fastens the bracelet around her wrist. Then she goes to her bag, takes out a small box. I was going to post these to you, but since you're here... Charles opens the box to reveal a pair of gold cufflinks engraved with entwined C's. When you wear them, you can think of me. Charles's eyes fill with tears. Camilla wipes them away. She kisses him gently. She wants nothing more than to tell Charles to forget Diana, stay here with her. But she knows that simply can't happen. Charles has a life of duty to fulfil. They've spent the last eight years dealing in what-ifs and bitter regrets. It hasn't got them anywhere. So she gently pushes Charles away. You know you have to fix it with her, don't you? You need to make sure that in two days' time, she's standing there beside you. Charles looks defeated, but instead of heading for the door, he pulls Camilla close again. This time, she doesn't push him away. She buries her head in his shoulder and sobs, knowing this really is the end. Twenty eighth of july nineteen eighty one, South Kensington. Diana sips her tea, rubs her red eyes. She's been hiding out at her sister Sarah's apartment since yesterday's rehearsal. Charles has been calling her all day, clearly desperate to talk. But she's not ready yet. Not until she's decided whether she can go through with this. Returning from the shops, Sarah practically dives through the door. It's crazy out there. Photographers everywhere. Diana grimaces. Oh, God, what did you tell them? Nothing. What's unusual about a girl spending time with her sister before the big day? Sarah sits beside her, face etched with concern. You can't hide here forever. You have to talk to Charles. It was just a gift. It's common for royals to give them to old girlfriends. Diana feels the tears sting her eyes again, shakes her head. It's more than that with the two of them. I can't do it. I can't marry a man who loves someone else. Diana looks into Sarah's eyes, imploring her to understand. 
Instead, she throws her hands up in exasperation. For goodness sake, the television cameras are lined up along the wedding route. The crowds are gathered on the streets. Your face is on a million tea towels. I just don't think you can back out of this now. Well, I don't want to marry a guy who's in love with someone else, but tea towels, you say? <laughs> I feel like Sarah's bought a job lot and that is why she's pushing this so hard. She was going to sell a load outside the flat. Diana's heart sinks as the reality of her situation seeps back in. This is bigger than her. If she walks away, she'll be letting the whole country down. All she can do is throw herself into the role of Princess of Wales and make the best of it. When the phone rings again, she knows it will be Charles. Resigned to her fate, she answers... She apologises for her outburst yesterday and tells him she's coming back. A few hours later, Diana returns to Clarence House. A gift from Charles awaits her. A signet ring engraved with the Prince of Wales's feathers. She knows she should be pleased, but it does nothing to ease her mind. It lacks the intimacy of his gift to Camilla. You might as well have got her a paperweight. It does sound like this is something you could probably buy in the official shop. A loud bang from outside makes her jump. Diana walks over to the window, watches the fireworks going off over Hyde Park, part of the pre-wedding celebrations. She runs to the toilet and makes herself sick, just as she has done most nights since the engagement. What's happening to her is overwhelming, and this is the only way she can hang on to any sense of control. Her stomach empty, Diana's anxiety eases. She tells herself it's fine. Camilla may be getting a nice bracelet, but she's not getting the real prize. Diana is. Twenty ninth of July, nineteen eighty one, City of London. Dressed in his full naval commander uniform, Charles waves to the sea of people lining the streets as his royal car pulls up outside St Paul's. He's never seen such frenzied jubilation. He's been told 750 million people are expected to watch the event on television worldwide. This is it. There's no going back now. It really was the succession of its day. It really was. In many ways. (laughs) (laughs) That is an incredible amount of people around the globe watching that wedding. Until last year, it was the most watched broadcast of all time. It's easy to forget in an era where it feels like we've had some big royal moments on television in the last few years. This really was the first of its kind. People were fascinated in Charles and Diana in a way that they hadn't been with previous royal relationships. This certainly wasn't just a marriage. This was a global phenomenon. Charles enters the cathedral to Dame Kiri Takanawa singing the first few bars of Let the Bright Seraphim. The vast hall is playing host to 2,500 guests, among them kings and queens, dignitaries from across the globe. Then Diana enters. There's a collective gasp at the sight of her elaborate dress with a 25-foot lace train. No one can take their eyes off her, Charles included. Diana looks every inch the fairy tale princess. She hasn't let him down. When she reaches his side and they kneel before the archbishop, Charles finally feels ready. Saying their vows, he means every word. He's going to take this seriously, give this union everything he's got. When it's Diana's turn to speak, he smiles at her reassuringly. She smiles back through her veil and he's reminded of the first time they spoke. Her kindness, her empathy. He's certain he can love her as she deserves. As they walk back down the long aisle of the church together, passing endless well-wishers, Charles squeezes Diana's hand, proud of her. Then, amongst a sea of faces, he spots Camilla. He can tell from her moist eyes she's been crying. In a heartbeat, All those old feelings flood back. He stays on her, desperate to catch her eye. When he does, Camilla quickly looks away. That's the clincher for Charles. 
he knows she still feels exactly as he does. He walks on with his new bride, his good intentions evaporating. As they step outside, the crowd roars its approval. Despite being surrounded by thousands of people, Charles has never felt more alone. Because as much as he denies it, he will never be able to love anyone the way he loves Camilla. She is still the only woman for him. Has he just made the biggest mistake of his life? Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the first episode in our series, The Crowded Marriage. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said or where. It is a dramatisation inspired by historical events. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Charles by Sally Bedell smith The Diana Chronicles by Tina Brown, Charles and Camilla, Portrait of a Love Affair by Giles Brandreth, and Diana, Her True Story by Andrew Morton. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. Wendy Granditor wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Our sound design is by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. This episode was produced by Millie Chu. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leludis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Louie for Wondering.